Oh, uh, 10 o'clock on a given Thursday. Our last day of broadcasting here in Pioneer Plaza, very important. And Jane Grutzel joins us on this very iconic day to talk about Voices of Hawaii, which is very interesting. And I, you know, I'm so glad we found you. We found you through Willie Moore. Yes. Who's one of our you know, regular guests, um, an amazing man in his own right. He's been one of my supporters. I interviewed him, and since then yes. we've been best friends. As well you should have. Uh, well, welcome to the show, thank Jane. Thank you. <laughs> so you interview people. That's what you do. And you've interviewed, oh, gosh, tons of them. No, not tons. 75. 75. Okay, that's a lot. As of yesterday. Yesterday was number 75. Okay. Yeah, that's my last one for this phase of the project. Okay. And this, yeah. and this phase of the project, as opposed to other phases of the project, by the way, the project is Voices of Hawaii, and it's a series of interviews that Jane has been doing in order to write a book, publish a book, this year, or rather 2020. I'm already in there. 2020. I hope uh, so. With, with these interviews. Uh, yes. The interviews will be verbatim? Uh, no. Well, that's an interesting thing. I started out, and they would be verbatim. I would just take the interview, and then I let people edit their interviews to make sure they're accurate. And then we also edit them for readability, just to make, it, make sure I don't uh -huh. ask any stupid questions. And, uh, and then I thought, well, I'll just plop that in a book. I don't think there's an audience for that. So what I'm doing instead is taking the interviews and then harvesting material. Like I might talk to you, or I might talk to Willie or someone else, and you all talk about some similar topic, maybe TV in Hawaii. So I put it over here in the chapter on media in Hawaii. Or you might have talked about philanthropy, so I'll put it in the chapter about philanthropy. I've interviewed several ranchers, so I'm doing ranching. You know, Voices, Voices of Hawaii is the topic. The title may change. Some people aren't happy because Voices of Hawaii means every voice in Hawaii. Yeah. And surely I've just interviewed the people I know. Yeah. And the people who've led me. I'll interview you, and you'll say, oh, Jane, you need to interview so-and-so. So I'll call so-and-so and say, would you like to be interviewed? And they say, yes. When? Tomorrow? Sure. See you at <laughs> 9. And that's how the whole this thing is, is gone. Do. Just like that. <laughs> just like, and I've just followed the leads, and when a door sure. opens, I go you through go where it. where it takes you. Yeah. And my... The, the sort of subtitle that I have for my project is um, Collecting the Oral Histories of People Who Have Participated in the Destiny of Hawaii. The Destiny of Hawaii. Isn't that great? That's, the that's people really... who have participated in the Destiny of Hawaii. And I chose dates. I don't know if you knew that my father was a lawyer in of Honolulu. Course, and he lived here and worked here as a lawyer from 1941 to 2003. Uh, 2004, sorry. So ah, the, those are the dates I used. That's why the dates you selected, those very dates. Yes. 1941. 1941 yeah. to 2004. That was the year that Garner Anthony changed the telephone number, okay, of the uh, Anthony Hoddick firm. You remember that firm? Yes, Another of course. Yeah. What do you mean? To 537-1941. Because he handled the Marshall Law case. He defended... The federal government's determination of martial law in Hawaii. He was so proud of that that he changed the phone number to be 1941. I love that story. <laughs> I'd never heard that. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you know, this whole project started because Jim Case, the lawyer, wrote a book called Hawaii Lawyer. And I read it and loved it. And I thought, oh, I wish my father had written a book. Then I realized I knew so many people who knew my father, had been hired by my father, trained by my father, worked with my father, and I asked them, there were about 10 of them, and I said, would you let me interview you? We can talk about my father. And we did. And then we, interviewed, then we talked about their lives and their accomplishments, and the most interesting thing was they each told me about what their passion for the law was. And when they began to talk about why they like security and exchange law, which you're thinking is a big yawn. Yeah. I was going, really? Tell me more. Yeah. They made it so interesting. Yeah. Public utility law, yeah. tax law, corporate yeah. law. It yeah. was a gift. But and sometimes they told me it's about an evolution, father. don't you know? I mean, it's an evolution where you get into it because some senior partner hands you a case. You have no choice but to take the case. And when the case is over, you know something about that area of the law. And after a while, you develop a kind of retrospective affiliation with that area, a re retrospective defense of your participation in that area. So what they tell you their reason is for being in that area may not have been their reason originally. No? You find that? 
Well, they each told me um, that they went to law school for various reasons. Sometimes it was get out of the military or the draft, and sometimes it was uh, uh, because they didn't want to be a teacher and they didn't know what else to do, so law seemed the thing. However, once they got into law school, each one of them seemed to develop a passion for something. One man told me a fascinating story. He grew up in Fresno, California. His um, grandfather and his parents were both sent to internment camp. He's Japanese. They were farmers in Fresno. They both went to internment camps during the war. Then when they got out, they didn't know where to go, so they went back to Fresno, where they owned nothing, starting all over again. They learned the lesson of how important land is. So they began to put the land in the name of the children who were citizens because they've been born here. This man then, from this background, grows up to be one of the best trust state attorneys in Honolulu because <laughs> he understands sure, the value sure, of law. Sure, sure, Isn't that sure. that great? Sure. Mm. Strikes me that the book, uh, the book to come, but the interviews that are, you've done over the past few years um, are mostly lawyers, am I right? No, that's where it started. I interviewed 10 lawyers from my father's firm, and I interviewed at least 10 lawyers from other firms, and that was fascinating, particularly yeah. because of the racial glass ceiling that many of the Asians face. They talk about it very openly, and so then I can talk about it very openly in my book. About the inter I have one section in which I call segregated neighborhoods, and I talk about that issue, and then integrated boardrooms. The integrated boardrooms is a wonderful chapter because it tells you how people began to realize we can't be all one kind. We need to have all of us participating. Yeah. That, was a, that wasn't a long time ago. That was more recent. Uh, well, that was uh, the years. Actually, I don't know the years in which that happened. But uh, Henry Clark, for example, went to uh, uh, the gas company where he was um, a board member. And he said, you know, our, our consumers are all oriental, that's the word he used, and our employees are mostly oriental, and we don't have any on our board. What's wrong with that? And the board said, well, this is the way it's always been, this is the way it will always be. He said, that's not right. Yeah. And they said, well, go ahead, do something about it. So he did. He got a Chinese man and a Japanese man to be on the board, and that's where it began. <laughs> you know, I, we, we did a program with the uh, Hawaii State Bar Association three, four years ago. About I watched the, it. <clears throat> called the, uh, what was it called? The, the three-digit lawyers. The three-digit lawyers. Yeah, and uh, we had stories from fellows who'd been practicing mm, right around statehood, even before. And they had uh, Asian guys. They had some stories about how those Hollies mistreated them, wouldn't give them jobs, uh, had the most racist possible, you know, uh, uh, approaches to things. And, um, and it really ticked them off, and it actually defined their thinking about how you deal with such issues going forward. I was I was fascinated because in my time practicing, uh, oh, I really, are you a I really, lawyer? Yes, and oh, I'm, I didn't know that. I'm a chop suey firm lawyer. Chop you know? suey firm chop lawyer. Chop suey firm lawyer. So <laughs> we didn't know race. Yeah. <laughs> but back when yeah. there was race, and yeah. and there's a whole generation of lawyers in the three digit crowd that yeah. was, you know, ticked off about that yeah. even even now. Yeah. Um, so it it changed. Yeah. It changed, and, and that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, in talking to these people. You could, you, and you, you organized it by subject, right? No, I, I, simply, I simply interview you. If you're my interviewee, uh, I say, how did, how did you or your family get to Hawaii? But then you organized it get by to subject. Hawaii? Well, I, I harvest out the material that is subject related. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I wanted to try, I, I know this is not exactly what you intended, but I wanted to try to connect the dots. If you're talking about people, lawyers and otherwise, who have had, who's, who's, whose destiny was intertwined with the destiny of the state, okay? then you have to see it in a dynamic fashion. You have to see the changes that happened in their lives and in their subject lives um, and figure out uh, from that, you know, perhaps a whole new look at the way Hawaii has developed since statehood. Did you, did you feel that happening when you were interviewing? Yesterday was my 75th interview. I will tell you, after every interview, I'll call my brother and say, John, this is the best one ever. <laughs> every one. Well, so yesterday was the best one ever. <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. <laughs> and it put a lot of things into perspective for me in a way I hadn't thought of it before. It's very difficult to put it all into words. The main thing I want to say is that I'm not a sage and I'm not a philosopher. I'm a collector of stories. My experience is to sit 
with somebody and hear the glory of their story. It's such a gift that people will sit and tell me their stories. Then my job is to, to the best of my ability, convey that to my audience. And I want to be clear about one thing. Even though it started as the Marshall Goodsill story, because I wanted to know what my father did at his office, despite the fact that I worked there for a long time, you know, a messenger girl and receptionist firm, on the yeah. weekends. Yeah. yeah, I had no idea what my father did at work. It has grown so far beyond that. And I've interviewed everybody from every top and bottom of the socioeconomic scale, width and breadth of uh, careers. Um, um, so let's go back again. Your question is? Well, I have another question. Yeah. That is this. It, more and more in this conversation, it appears to me that you, this, is, this, this avocation of yours mm. uh, and the book you will publish, mm. Um, it's really an extension of your time at that firm, time with your father, whether you knew what he was doing on his desk no, or not. it's an extension of my having grown up in Hawaii, grown okay. up here and having ownership of this place. To what extent is this an ode to your father? To what extent are you expressing a relationship with your father in doing this? The private part of this book is that I have discovered an entire new Marshall Goodsill. Oh my goodness, the things he could accomplish, the people he could uh, motivate. The, the lessons he learned, the breadth of which he could practice law. One of the interesting things, Jay, is, is back in the day, there was no communication with the mainland. So you couldn't send work to be done over there by experts over there. So you had to become an expert here, which is what my father did. Sure. He became an expert. He did sure, all kinds sure. of law. And people say that's yeah. rare about yeah. uh, lawyers. Uh, um, so the private part of this is that I have developed a deeper relationship with my father. Of course, I knew him as a person, but not as his profession, which was his superpower. I think of him as Clark Kent, you know, the mild-mannered reporter, but underneath, you know, brilliant intellect. Now I know that part of him. Uh, uh, but this is not the Marshall Goodseal story. It's evolved from that. Now this is Hawaii's story. It's the voices of Hawaii. And I may or may not even put the part about the law firms in there. You were born and raised here. I was born and raised here. Yeah, so you could see that, but maybe not fully integrated until now. I had a similar experience doing this, you know. You talk to somebody like this, like one-on-one yes. -on -one like yes. this, yes. and it's a special experience. Never yes. forget it. Never forget any yes. of these interviews. And so you learn things. You have thoughts you would never otherwise have. They, people educate you all along the way. And people can talk about the same subject. You know, there are many issues that are controversial. Bishop Estate, uh, and all the controversy. I talk to Oz Stender, and he tells me one side of the story. I talk to the people from Command Man, they tell me the other side of the story. But what you do is you get the heart of it. You understand this and this, all the same. People are all trying to do the best they can, come up with the best possible solution. Do you like all the people you've interviewed? I, that would be like a miracle, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I asked one man if, he, if there were a lot of racial slurs when he was growing up, and he said, of course, he's older than I am, he said, of course there were. And I said, did you ever cast any? He, he said, I would never admit to such a thing. But do you think I would ever admit to not liking somebody I interviewed? <laughs> Got it. Got it. Good answer. <laughs> well, what about when they, when they don't but tell you? But you know, them? when people show me their heart, I love everybody. Yes, I understand that. You do? Even if their heart may not be in the same place. Well, even if they don't agree with you, or even if they have a different political opinion or a different uh, life view, when yeah. you understand it from their point of view, all of a sudden it as melts away. As long as it's sincere. As long as it's sincere. And dignified, you know, gracious. What about when, when they lie to you? I don't know that I've had any lies, and if I have, that's their lie, not mine. If you discover that somebody has lied to you, what happens then? Do you still include it in your record of the interview? I have no idea. I haven't come up with that yet. Never even thought of it. <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, we talked about this before the show, but I want to I sort of get a handle on how you do this. This is a professional inquiry now. Oh, excellent. So you call them up and you meet them somewhere. Maybe a coffee shop? No. Maybe somebody's home? Oh, what? no. Uh, it's always got to be quiet because it's an audio taped interview. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 here's been the most amazing thing. These are people I don't even know, right? So I either meet them at their office my home or their home. People I don't even know. Yeah, sure. Never been a problem. And how do you open it up? What do you say? I how do say, you make them you know, comfortable? 
I say, I'm going to record this, then I'm going to have it transcribed, and you'll be able to look it over. So any changes that you want to make in it, you're welcome to do. This is a collaborative effort. And then I say, let's start by my asking you how your family or your people got to Hawaii. And then let's talk about your ancestors. And then let's talk about your life, and let's talk about how it unfolded. So it's, it's personal. It's their personal life. You want their life story. You want the stories. Yeah. Uh, Voices of Hawaii is stories of Hawaii. Yeah. It reminds me of The Descendants, the movie, remember? Yeah. You know, that was, that was a Hawaii story, which I always felt we did not, we, the state of Hawaii, not capitalize on that because some guys out of Hollywood put it together. Yes. Um, but if we looked at it, if yes. the people in Hawaii, yes. some familiarity with the way things work, yes. um, if we made that movie, it would have been a different, a better movie. And by the way, there's lots of stories, like the descendant stories. Lots there are of them. lots of stories. Now, that's an interesting thing. There are a lot of descendant stories, people who descended from the missionaries. There are also a lot of ascension stories, people who came over who were basically indentured servants for the uh, uh, plantation, who did what they needed to do and then rose up. And then I've spoken to two Supreme Court justices in Hawaii who came from nothing. And ended up Supreme Court justice. It's they're remarkable stories. I was talking to my wife about that this morning. Were you? She grew up in Kaloa, in Kauai, right next to the plantation. Yeah. McBride, I think it was. And the, the men, mostly men, but yeah. they're women too, yeah. on the plantations, they were the greatest generation. They were made of stern stuff. Yeah. They knew how to work. Yeah. They knew how to get it done. They were efficient. And they were kind to their families. I mean, the whole thing was a, was a model in citizenship, if you will. What level, what level of people are these? Are these the um, managers or the, the workers or Short story now above? that you're interviewing me. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> my, 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 my wife's family had a groaning board table. And after work, and I, when the whistle blew, everybody came to their house. And they offered them food for hours and food and drink and all that. One day, one fellow uh, couldn't come, and he called him and said, I, I can't make it today. Why can't you make it? I got promoted to uh, Luna. Uh -huh. I can't make it. Why can't you make it? This be a celebration. Well, I've, I've got to go down to the county courthouse and register Republican immediately, because if you're a Luna, you have to be a Republican. If, if you're one of the other guys, you have to be a Democrat. <laughs> that was really fabulous. Could he continue to party with them? Or did he need to oh, yeah. separate himself? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> the groaning board went on story. every day. <laughs> oh, that's a great part of the story. <laughs> it was a technicality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have collected some uh, stories from people who grew up on the plantations, so I call it plantation days. Just little vignettes. You know, it, nothing in my book is long or tedious. It's easy to read. Just little vignettes of people's memories. Speaking yeah. Hawaiian, how they learned it, how they unlearned it. You know, yeah. the people in Hawaii, the Hawaiians had to unlearn their own language because yeah. it was uh, outlawed. So, so then you're, you're talking to them, and you're asking them about their lives. You're tracking through your curious person, yeah. and you have the you know the background and understanding to ask good questions on that. So, how long would these interviews last? An hour, two, three? What? Oh, uh, never go more than two. You know, I'm a, I'm a therapist by trade, a psychotherapist. And there's a reason why therapy sessions are generally about an hour, hour and a half long. People get tired. So um, usually about an hour and a half, between an hour and a half and two, depending on the depth of the story and the succinctness of the interviewee. Mm, sure. Some people talk too much and some too People little, repeat yeah. themselves a lot, so it takes a long time to tell the story. But this is the, this is the marvel of being able to uh, edit because it becomes very streamlined. They love it. They say, oh, I sound so good. <laughs> yeah. So you just put a, 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 some a tape recorder on the, on the table? You use your iPhone. Use your iPhone. You just there use your iPhone, and then you send it directly to your files, and it's stored forever and all time. And somebody transcribes. You can send yes. it to somebody to transcribe. I pay a transcriber on the mainland. She's a Holly girl, but she has learned more about Hawaiian. <laughs> she does now. <laughs> okay, you get it back, and then you circulate it to what? The person, the interviewee, uh, for, I, I guess, accuracy and comment. Now, suppose the interviewee has said something that's embarrassing, mm -hmm. because if you, if you do a good interview, this, this is likely to happen. Mm -hmm. He's likely to tell you something private, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do then? Do you take his word and cut it out? Oh, no, I ask. I, I will say, I will highlight this part in red and say, um, Jay, 
You talk about in your family background and, and something about the finances. You might not want everybody to know that. And your choice. So then when you edit it, your choice. Yeah. And uh, one guy said, he used a name. He said, uh, when I met with so-and-so, uh, he was a great guy, but I had to count my fingers afterward to make sure they were all there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't think we should put this guy's name in. I don't think this is right. There is a line there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just, I confer with them and say, I would leave this out. I would edit, or this is how I would edit it. Sometimes if they're talking about something very complex, a legal issue, I say, it's beyond me to be able to put this into words that people will understand. Will you take a crack at it? Yeah, yeah. So you're going you're gonna to have active editing, active conversation active with them after. And it, that's kind of an interesting thing in oral histories because many oral historians don't want you to touch the original document. That's it. That's what the person said. You leave it all in there. I don't believe that. I've, I worked for the County Historical Commission where I live. and. I believe an edited product is more authentic and accurate. Sure, because you know, people make, make mistakes when they speak. Yes. And they say things they really rather take back. That's and right. If you give them that opportunity, it'll be a, a better reflection of who they are. That's right. I'm sure, I'm sure and that's much true. more interesting to read than all the ums and alls and false oh, sure, starts. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So. so then, okay, and you've accumulated all these, 75 as of yesterday, and you're going to just splat, put them in a book? Is that going to work? No. I don't know how I'm going to handle that part of it. First, I'm going to harvest things from the interviews and put them voices of philanthropy, voices of the ranchers, voices of the warriors, uh, voices of the old Hawaiians, voices of conservation, whatever, all my topics, and print that book, publish that book. Then if there's a big hue and cry and people say, we think you should uh, get these transcripts out there, maybe I'll find a way to put them online. Uh, I don't Easy know how to enough. do it, but someone can do it. Give and, me a call. Oh, how nice. Thank you. I will. Be careful, because when a door opens, I walk through it. So if, they, if there can be an archive of these for historical record and research, it would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It will be. Uh, and, but and, it's dense reading. Not everybody's going to want to do it. But you might want to look at, maybe you're interested in lawyers. Maybe you just want to download 10 of them. The rest you're not interested in. It should be your prerogative. I think we're in a time down, don't you, Jane? And maybe this is what motivated you a couple of years ago when you started out. That we're in a time that we need to take stock of, 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 of the living legends, if you will. That's what we call the bar thing, the living legends. Um, and like, um, we, we, have to, we have to talk to them before we can't talk to them anymore. It's like Steven Spielberg's uh, Shoah project where he talk, talks to the Holocaust survivors because soon enough there won't be any and you won't be able to record anything. And uh, he, he did it in video, but it's the same idea. And so we have the Bar Association thing. We have The Descendants, the movie, for what it's worth. I think Hawaii, don't you, is in a time of, it's a pivotal time somehow. Um, and we really need to find ourselves. And the way to do that is to do what you're doing. No? I hope so. Um, I, I think, in a way, every time is a pivotal time. All the years that we lived through from 41 to 2004 were pivotal times. People made decisions then that affect us now. So now we're going back and looking at what happened in the last 50 years of the last century. To kind of see what happened, how we got to where we are. Some places good, some places not so good. But now it's time to maybe, it's a, it's a new sort of a fresh way to look at how the sausage was made. Yeah. So some of the people you have talked to, I'm just reading off the email correspondence that I've had with you and Bill Moore. Um, Ron Moon, lawyer. Supreme Court Justice. Bill Tam, he's a lawyer too. Isn't lawyer. He? Mm -hmm. uh, Alice Gill. Alice she, Gill. She's in philanthropy. Yeah. Oh, well, here's the story about Alice. I meet with her because a friend says you have to interview her, so I call her. And I'm not a phone caller. If they can't text or email, I mean, it doesn't work. But I call her and I say, she says, okay, come on over. I say, when? She says, this afternoon. Okay, so I'm there. And we talk for two hours. And at the end, I say, this feels good. Have I got most of your story? She says, oh, no. We've just talked about my family. We haven't even talked about my career. You know, I'd known Alice all my life from growing up years. I never knew what her career was. I said, okay, let's spend another time. So I go back for another two-hour interview. She's the only one who's four hours. But she had that much material. She told me all about developing Ala Moana. She told me all about the renovation of Iolani Palace. Priceless stories need to be recorded. 
She says she's recorded everybody in her family, and nobody's ever taken an interview of her. <laughs> so I gave it to her, and she said, I don't know if I want to turn this over to you to write a book about. I might want to write my own book. In which case, I go, good for you. <laughs> Have it. This is my gift to you. Can I use a couple sections? Stories. Yes, of course. You know? So. Well, you know, it, 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 it gives me the thought, which we talked about a little bit. Is that, is that you, it's, it's interactive. Any interview is interactive. You're asking questions, of course. You could ask this question or that question, get a completely different approach. And then, of course, you're saying things. You're telling that person a little about what your orientation is. And so it's a relationship. It's a relationship. So you take these 75 people. Had you not interviewed them, you would not know them nearly as well Do you or know, have that relationship. I have 75 brand new best friends. You bet. But after talking to you, if I need help figuring out how to put these things online, I will call you. And it will be heart to heart. You can either help or you can't, but we have this relationship. This is, you know, you said, what's, I kind of get chills about this. What's the point of all this? The point is when people meet face to face, that it doesn't matter really what our, the divisions are between us. As long as there's something heartfelt, there can be love, there can be aloha. I mean, I can be talking to the lawyers who were against the very, I, mean, I can be talking to the lawyer whose job was to get a tunnel cut through the Ko'olau Mountains. And these people don't like it. This was this person's job. And then I say to this person, what do you think about that? And they say, that was their job. I didn't like it, but they were representing their clients. It's like there's an understanding of quid pro quo, the mm -hmm. real meaning of the word, <laughs> right? It reminds me of uh, the, the uh, Mission House program at the Oahu Museum, if you've ever attended that. Oh, yes. They, go and give, they give talks about this decedent and that decedent. Yes. And the most wonderful part is when one decedent is talking through an actor, tells you about the other decedent. And he says, oh, that guy, he was mean to me. And then you go down the road to the other side of the cemetery, and, and you, you hear the actor who is representing the second person, and he says, oh, that guy, he was mean to me. And, and you begin to understand the whole social process in the state. <laughs> you have got it. You put your finger right on it. That's it, Jay. That's been the experience I've had. And it's not my job to make sense of it. I quote this person, and I quote this person in the same paragraph. They said it, not me. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, you say uh, you want to give people uh, an insight into how their lives were and uh, enjoy them as as people and so forth, just as you have. You want to share, you know, the joy of the interview with more people. And I fully appreciate that. But you know, there's more. There's more. Because I think whether you realize it or not, when they read this book, they're, one, they're understanding the dynamic, the social dynamic, maybe the business dynamic of the state. If, I can, if I can capture it, if this can, is my well, job. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. And then finally, and this is, this is what I think I would be looking for, I'd be looking for the historical dynamic, how things were changing within the life of each of them, and in parallel, all of them, to learn about what the core you know, culture point, the core sociology, the, the core development of the state really is. I know that's, that's another book, entirely different book, but, but I think some people will look at this book and look for that. Well, I say to the publisher, now in my second book, and he says, well, if your first, first book is a bestseller, there may be a second book. Okay. If not, not so much. I said, well, okay then, I'm going to put everything I got into my first book. <laughs> I could keep going like this. I have a lot more energy to do this. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, yeah. this has been led by the universe in a very divine way. And it's not me. I'm just the storyteller. And I just get to highlight some of the people. That's your story. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jane Jay. Jane Goodsell, it's been a delight. Thank you. So nice. So nice to talk to you. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.